Welcome to Syntax, a Generative Introduction, 4th Edition. My name is Andrew Carney. I'm a professor of linguistics at the University of Arizona. I'm the author of your textbook, and I'll be leading you through this series of video tutorials. In this video, we address our third controversy that arises in contexts of ellipsis. The particular kind of ellipsis that's at controversy here is called pseudogapping. Pseudogapping is a phenomenon where you seem to be deleting material that doesn't form a single constituent. So take, for example, the sentence, Darren has eaten more squid sandwich than Riza has octopus. Now, um, there's not a strict identity between the two verb phrases here, because obviously the second clause in, entails Riza has eaten octopus or Riza has eaten octopus sandwich. So, um, and what is left after you do deletion is that material that doesn't line up between the two uh, clauses. Um, this kind of construction often uh, shows up in a comparative uh, environment where you're comparing one thing to another. Um, you leave off all the material um, that is not contrasted. So in our first clause, eating more squid sandwich. In our second clause, octopus. Um, only octopus is the contrastive material, the, the, um, the comparative material. You can see this even more clearly in an example like the lawyer can't prove Paul innocent, but he can Della. If you think about what's being elided here or elipted, um, you'll see that what's being deleted is prove and innocent. This is clearly not a constituent because Della is right in the middle of that. So um, it seems to be the case then that this is some kind of non-constituent ellipsis. Regularly speaking, in most pseudo-gapping, the thing that survives the deletion operation is the direct object. So we want to have an explanation for that. Um, now, uh, there are two hypotheses about um, this particular structure. One comes from the linguist Howard Lasnik, and he suggests that what is going on here is that um, when you are working with the second clause, you've moved the direct object out of the verb phrase and into the specifier of agaropi. Now, we have, we have previously argued that this is um, what happens to get accusative case on DPs, uh, that you need to have this operation. You need it for object shift. Uh, and you need it for uh, various other kinds of operations like um, subject to object raising. Uh, we also needed, this was also one hypothesis that worked for explaining antecedent contained deletion. Um, once you've moved this DP out of this structure, what gets elided or ellipted is this verb phrase right here. And because the DP is no longer inside of the verb phrase, uh, it survives. But everything else that would be inside of the verb phrase, such as a, like the verb prove and an adjective like innocent uh, in the last example we saw, gets deleted. So that's one possibility. Um, I actually think this is probably the best hypothesis for this, but I would like to raise to you an alternative. It's the um, alternative uh, identified by Agbayani and Zorner. Now, um, Agbayani and Zorner refer to a phenomenon that's known as across-the-board movement. Across-the-board movement is a very interesting structure that we have not looked at previous to this video. It's, uh, it most often shows up in situations involving WH for a movement. And it's those situations where it appears as if WH um, movement has two traces, so it has two origin points. So what does Calvin like but Rory hate? What we've done here is we have uh, done WH movement uh, from the first clause, you know, Calvin likes what? And we've also done it from the second clause, Rory hates what? But we only have a single what word. 
So a single moved element seems to have two traces under your coordination. This is the what across the board movement is. The across the board movement also shows up in situations like Calvin likes but Rory hates peanuts. Uh, that is also thought to be across the board movement. Now, uh, since this is a phenomenon you find elsewhere, Agbayani and Zorner propose that this can be an explanation for what happens in pseudo-gapping. So um, they propose that what happens is that in uh, English, we have already claimed that um, verbs move into their voice heads. That's short verb movement. We had to claim that to explain the word order in ditransitive constructions, you'll recall uh, back from chapter 14. So V moves into voice. And uh, what Agbayani and Zorner propose is that cases that involve pseudogapping um, just uh, do an across-the-board movement impl implementation of this V to voice raising. So if you can imagine this for a moment, uh, we have a single voice head, and we have a, uh, a complex um, verb phrase. So um, r r uh, Darren has eaten more squid, um, and uh, there's an active voice here which introduces Darren, and it takes as its complement a complex verb, a DP, and a comparative CP, a CP that is compared against the uh, properties of this DP. And uh, what has happened here is we get across the board movement. So we have a trace of the verb eat that appears here, uh, the main object, more squid, and then we have a secondary trace, which also is a trace of this verb eat, um, that appears in the comparative clause. So we have two movements of uh, the verb eat uh, from two different positions into this single voice head. So that is going to give us uh, the effect where element where you leave the object behind, but you get rid of the verb. The verb is raised up higher in the tree. So let's now compare these two hypotheses. We have the hypothesis that we've moved um, the object into the specifier of, specifier of agar op, and we have the hypothesis that the verbs um, in the two clauses have undergone across the board movement uh, up into the V head. There are issues with both of these. So first of all, um, let's take the case of a sentence like Brandon has been reading more novels than he has short stories. This is a classic example of pseudo-gapping. Um, we have uh, downstairs, we have uh, the only thing that survives from within the verb phrase is short stories. Um, but notice that more than just short stories, uh, more than just the main verb has been elided. The auxiliary verb that marks the progressive has also been elided. So this uh, verb to be um, uh, is linked to reading, right? So let's think about that for a moment. The agar op is going to be lower down in the tree than this um, functional head right here. So remember, under Lasnik's ellipsis hypothesis, what you do is you take the direct object and you move it into the specifier of the agar op. And then uh, the reason that um, uh, this element survives ellipsis is the only thing you delete is the VP. The problem is in then sentences like this one, you're deleting not just the um, VP, you're also deleting this auxiliary that's higher than the agar op. So uh, the escape hatch, if you will, of moving the direct object into this position um, is undermined by the fact that you delete stuff that's higher than it. So that's, what, that's a problem for Lasnik's hypothesis. But there's also a similar problem for the across-the-board hypothesis of Agbayani and Zerner. Um, so you'll remember um, that it relies upon across-the-board movement of verb heads into voice heads. So you take two verbs and you move them both into the same voice head. Um, but the problem with that is there are sometimes things that aren't voice heads that get elided in the second clause. So um, if our explanation was we took the prove 
that was down here in this embedded clause and moved it up to the voice that's up here. Um, that would explain why prove gets deleted, but it doesn't explain why innocent gets deleted. Um, the absence of the main verb in pseudo-gapping under the ATB hypothesis is because of head movement. But if you're deleting things other than heads, then that hypothesis can't work. So there are problems for both of these hypotheses that have been uh, uh, proposed. So what's the solution? Neither of those hypotheses seem to work. Well, uh, frankly, that's for you, the syntacticians of the future, to figure out. Um, this is what it's like being a real scientist. Sometimes we have hypotheses that sort of work and sort of don't work, and, and um, sometimes we don't know what the right answer is. And this is one of those cases. Neither of the um, solutions that have been proposed seem to be correct. So it's your job to go and figure that out.